good sign as far as they're concerned. She was ill. She was most <laughs> definitely ill. So he makes them give them a, uh, give him a ride back to his apartment, um, where he explains great length that he does remember this woman because she has this beautiful head of black hair, which is common to tuberculosis patients. Your hair grows beautifully, apparently. Something first I'll look forward to. Um, but explains that he does remember her because he said, well, you know, what is your business in Indochina as part of the clerical processing? She said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm deathly ill, so I need to find this, I need to go north and find the secret of eternal life. As though one of us would say, you know, it's raining, I need an umbrella. Just A led to B as far as she was concerned. Um, and she explained that she was going to go up to Luang Prabang, up in the kingdom of Lao, which was a French protectorate, and see what she could find from there. So Henri and Pierre go back to their boss and explain this, and he says, oh, well, that's fine, you know, get on the first boat up the Mekong. It's a good time of year, it's the rainy season, you can go up river. He said, well, we could fly, you know, a lot of people fly to Luang Prabang. He's like, no, 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 we want the army to think you're working hard. The longer you're away, the better. Take a boat. <laughs> okay. Well, Henri is, you know, thinks... Well, I don't really want to leave. Sorry, Henri is not, he would prefer to fly and not spend all his time on the river, but Pierre just thinks this is the greatest thing ever after all his studies to actually be out there on a boat up the Mekong. What could be more perfect? So they steam their way up through Cambodia, and now this is as they come into Laos. Um, and they're on this one ship that they're on. There's the two of them. The only other Caucasian is this guy, Charton, who's a missionary. Meek little guy. Upriver, the Mekong, Mekong was still the color of cafe creme, and even at the worst heat of the day, I couldn't keep myself from the strip of deck in front of the rattling wheelhouse. The wind whistled through the air holes in my topi. Tattered villages appeared round each long bend. Copper-colored basalt crags came into view, only to disappear in the silver haze. And for three days, I kept a mental list of the waterborne detritus sweeping past. Fish traps, gold mining sluices, straw hats, Stripped and numbered logs roaring past like locomotives. Two dogs swimming to save their lives. Pulverized canoes, entire living trees, drowned buffalo, a teak balcony railing, and one drowned monkey. This last I could never have identified if not for Duke, the navigator, who slumped beneath the wheelhouse window day and night in red striped pajamas and a black fedora. He tugged my trouser leg and raised a black nailed finger. Monkey, he intoned. I squint, squinted at the matted black ball shooting past in the tawny foam. As our location was too blustery to ignite a match, Duke kept an unlit Turkish cigarette between his lips and sounded like a character speaking the French of the Middle Ages. Flowers, he croaked. This next wasn't a bunch of Marguerite's daisies either, but raft after raft of vivid pink water lilies, the lotuses of myth, somehow cast adrift from the tranquil ponds of their childhoods. The wooded riverbanks looked dustier still as these tender islands swept past, and I couldn't help ruminating on the Buddha, their venerated sponsor. In Cambodia, the flame-shaped roofs of the Buddhist temples at first appeared on the bare banks, and then amongst the trees, some with freshly painted gold stupas, some with collapsed walls, but all capable of setting my pulse thumping behind my ears. It's one thing to wander through Saigon to the clangor of automobile horns, and and say to oneself, oh, this is the East. It's quite another to whisper it as a thousand-year-old temple juts out from a hillside to vanish the next moment behind the jungle canopy. The East is an ever-fleeting thing. Yet even as I congratulated myself on the exotica of my locale, our carbon papers now a week behind us, it struck me that the exotic is never an absolute, but merely otherness taken to its extreme, and that the coffee-colored Mekong, its surface coruscating with skimming white birds, must have been mundane to that poor boy paddling a log along the shallows there, just as the mildewed spires of Notre Dame, which to me spoke only of wet shoes and stalled buses, were doubtless the stuff of fairy tales to a Mexican farmer. I decided that an essay entitled On the Nature of the Exotic might prove instructive if only it could be contemplated under less thrilling conditions. <laughs> ah, Duck said behind me, Monsieur le Directeur, Jesus, these Malays exacerbate me, shouted Henri. The minute we leave home, it's as though they only know three words. Monsieur le Directeur, Monsieur le Directeur, do I look as though I could direct anything on the face of the earth? Indeed, he did not. A bona fide Monsieur le Directeur would have looked anxious, while I'm certain Henri Le Delic had never looked more relaxed in his life. His gait along the narrow deck was straight and erect, and his hair was not twisted into rat tails for once, but blew about his head like the mane of a modestly arrayed lion. What have you been quizzing him on, he asked. In what year did the Lelong brothers win the Battle of Jericho? 
Sharp Tom must have been after you, I said, for you to have climbed all the way up here. He holds his drink too well. Last night he started me talking. Then he found you again this morning. Henri unfolded his tartan handkerchief to wipe his streaming eyes. That stinging wind, sultry though it may have been, had rushed all the way down from Tibet. I believe I was extremely erudite in explaining this Tremier situation. Well, explaining what, exactly? It seems perfectly clear to me that the woman chose between this pipe dream of life eternal and certain death at the hands of tubercules in her lungs. Pipe dream or no, would any of us done differently in her dainty shoes? Yet Charton is angry at us for going after her. Can you imagine? Apparently, if she was dying of consumption in Paris and the nine-year-old boy depended upon her, she had to have gone to Lourdes for a miracle rather than abandoning him to drag herself off to where the word of God falls on deaf ears. Now, what sort of medical opinion is that? Well, he's a missionary. Don't try me. Is he really? Honestly, he gave us St. Pancras medals when we came aboard. Didn't you look? Oh, I thought it was a fishing lure. He's not a salesman either. Well, certainly he's a salesman. There you go. So they go ashore at the next town, um, which is very exciting for um, Pierre because there's a, a dilapidated old government rest house there where the old, all the steamboat passengers were expected to go ashore decades previous and sign their names. And so he actually sees Adelaide's ill, spidery signature in a book, and this, this is the first sort of concrete evidence that they're on the right track. So he's very excited about that. Um, I'll read a little bit more. Would you rather have one more chapter and then hear about the background of the book, or have the background and then the chapter? More. No, chapter first. It's unanimous. Two out of two. So after they leave the village, the captain says, oh, you know, we have to be on our way. We have to be in position in the morning to run the rapids. And so everyone's a little bit nervous about that. So it's now the next morning. We'd barely been served our coffee the next morning, monkeys in the canopy still shrieking their sunrise hymn, when crewmen swarmed over the ship, lashing barrels down, clamping portholes shut, and nailing tarpaulins over the hatches. I felt a clap on my shoulder, and there was Captain Malraux, unshaven and hollow-eyed, yet on tiptoe with excitement. We pressed against the rail as the deck passengers were herded beneath a canopy in the stern. If they're sitting on the roof, and we tilt even a little, whoop, that's the last of them, said Malraux, please. Go to your cabin. Are the cataracts that dangerous? I asked. He sucked voraciously on his lump of sugar cane. For an hour today, you'll feel alive. Every moment is a trial. Hmm, no margin for error, said Henri. Our work is like that. It's not true. We've been up the rapids at Priyatapong, I said. Is this so much worse? He wiped his mustache with the back of his hand and then climbed a the ladder. Keep an eye peeled for her bleached bones, Henri said. This may be as far as she came. My stomach clenched at the thought that my father could already have calculated to the hundredth decimal the unlikelihood that she was even still living. I once made the mistake of describing these rapids to my boy, said Charton, and they made me promise to lock myself in the cabin and crawl under the bed. Inside our cabin, it was difficult to relax. The frenzied stoking of the engines had started every piece of the ship shuddering like a franc coin on a tram line. From beneath his bed, Henri pulled his wooden case, reinforced with copper screws. In an entire week, my colleague had consumed only a 16-bottle case of wine, though our evening at the Continental had seen the end of five. Your economy has been remarkable, I said. Yes, put that in your report, you wretch. We pulled a pry bar from the valise. Through our porthole, I could only glimpse dark trees passing. Yet one sound was ever increasing, and I thought of putting my head out to see if an airplane was flying over. Henri looked up from the crate. Are those the rapids now? Suddenly the cabin tilted, our trunk slid out from the wall, and foaming brown water burst in from under the door, soaking on Reed in mid-thigh where he knelt. I lifted my feet above the inundation. A chorus of alarm sounded from the stern. A moment later we tilted just as sharply in the opposite direction. The water rushed out, the trunks resumed their original position, and Henri, extricating a single bottle, climbed to his feet. In the name of the Vice Regency, we'll see what this is about! We opened our door onto a whirlpool as large as a house, yawning below the rail, a teak log thrashing in its jaws like a matchstick in a drain. Spray lashed at us and our ears roared. I seized the rail, for I had no wish to await the inevitable in that rat trap of the cabin, and Henri looped his arm through mine while he struggled with the bottle opener around his neck. I shook him off, abetted by reprehensible language which neither of us could even hear. 
The stairs to the wheelhouse stood adjacent, and we crept up like delinquent schoolboys. With Henri gripping my elbow, I slid the door open, staggered backwards a step, then pitched headlong into the cabin as the boat heaved sideways. We found a chart table which was bolted to the floor and clung to it gratefully. Captain Malro grinned over his shoulder. The pleasure's all mine! <laughs> he wore only trousers and the kerchief around his neck, and every cord in his back stood out as he gripped the creaking wheel. At his barked command, a crew-cutted Cambodian pushed the brass handle forward for more steam. I pitied those stokers whose boiler room must have been bucking like a colt. Current holds the screws back, and the rudder can't respond, yelled Malro. I nodded sagely in response. Through the window, we watched Duke leap and contort like Nijinsky himself as he rushed from one side of his deck to the other. Beyond him lay a panorama of cataracts, so alarming that my gums suddenly tingled. These rapids were a meal for breaking ships into splinters. Maro barked at the Cambodian, and I guessed that the requested pressure hadn't been forthcoming. Duke pressed his face to the window, a baleful cigarette crushed against his chin. Henri proffered his half-empty bottle now of Patronina Grand Reserva. Not to worry, shouted Mauro. The starboard screws lost pressure, so the port screws having its way with us. The boat rattled like a car in a mine shaft as we sailed on a perfect diagonal towards a thrashing whirlpool. I saw the achingly calm water just beyond it as the Cambodian turned a crank above his head. Hold on, shouted Mauro. I wrapped my arms around the table leg. We tilted to the right, and the empty wine bottle rolled past to thud against the wall. The bolt securing the leg groaned like invalids. How far could we lean before capsizing? The Cambodian shouted again, but remarkably, with less alarm. Pressure's back, called Mauro. Despite our wretched angle, I climbed to my feet. The river broke over the bow, but that lovely stretch of water lay immediately before us, and an instant later the boat surged mightily onto the calm eddy. The boat righted itself. The worst was past us. I looked to see what was gripping my wrist and saw it was Henri's hand. But then I saw... We were still under maximum steam, flying over that glassy water like a torpedo. Maro shrieked in order. The Cambodian threw the handle into reverse. Boulders the size of churches rushed toward us. Maro fell back as the wheel spun like a, war a windmill, and I dropped to one knee. When the impact came, I was thrown against the back wall. Then the cold, sweated relief of opening one's eyes, to be able to open them, if only to look through a row of broken windows in a tangle of greenish-black trees. Lazare, whispered Henri, are you cognizant? Though our engines were silent, the roar of the rapids was loud as ever. I heard distant shouting. I sat up. The side of my head throbbed. Henri crouched before me, his wild eyes scrutinizing mine, his face still ashen. His lip was cut. Hum, he said. Then he vomited wine over my boot, and his purple sick felt so hot against my leg, I thought I'd been burnt and was instantly on my feet. I looked down at him, wiping his mouth with that handkerchief, and I wanted to smash his mottled head. Mist drifted in through the smashed windows. The abandoned wheel creaked pitifully. Where's Malro? I demanded. Someone coming, said Henri. The wheelhouse door shuddered, the knob rattled, then frame and door both fell inward with a crash. Duke peered in at us. Monsieur le directeur, he said, everything's broken.